The following message was preached from the pulpit of Bible Baptist Church, Oak Harbor, Washington. Well, you may recall and you may not recall what we were doing here last Wednesday night with the Word of God going forth. Uh, as a reminder, we were looking back in Ruth, which launched us then back into the New Testament of the book of Ephesians. Uh, we were looking at those handfuls of purpose. And I really felt uh, personally and as a church, uh, we were at a point, you know, seven days ago where it was just the grace of God was just uh, pouring down. And, and every time you looked up, it's as if he had directed someone else to throw down some some more bounty in front of us. And then, you know, you look up and is my hand going to get smacked when I reach out for it? And he says, no, 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 just as, as Boaz illustrating Christ uh, very clearly directed don't rebuke her you know rebuke rebuke her not and so the kind of the bottom line was you know God loves us and that's okay we don't have to fully understand it he just says pick it pick it up these handfuls of purpose and so rolled out a Wednesday and towards the uh, end of last week maybe Thursday or Friday I was looking ahead to this week and and uh, thinking I probably wouldn't want to be studying out, just to be honest, studying out a message on Christmas or the day after Christmas for, for tonight. So I was trying to get ahead. And in my daily reading, I had been reading through the book of Philippians and the Lord directed to a message. And uh, it didn't make a whole lot of sense, but uh, it is now. Imagine that. Uh, I don't always seek the whys of messages. I just seek the God saying yes and so I, I find it uh, somewhat of a balancing uh, Wednesday to Wednesday. Again, last week was everything's coming up roses, and that's okay. Just accept the love of God and these handfuls of purpose. And tonight's message is, is balanced a little bit the other way. What about when it doesn't look like there are handfuls of purpose just falling in our path? What if our path has some thorns in it or um, some other negative circumstances? And, and so... Again, I had outlined the message and studied it out and was confident in God's direction, but it wasn't until Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, day after Christmas, making a couple trips up to, up to Island Hospital in Anacortes to, to see Brother Slattery where I started saying, well, maybe everyone's not seeing handfuls of purpose in their path. Maybe they're spending Christmas on their back in a hospital saying, when am I going to get out of here? And then maybe Brother Howard is saying, you know, a wonderful Christmas. I'm getting word that my mom's not doing well, and i got to get on a plane and get down to, to Florida, and it's the middle of a bunch of busy stuff here, and I wasn't expecting this. And so uh, imagine that. God knows what he's doing in, in what we need. Um, and so, again, the message is, is from the book of Philippians, and we'll be looking at primarily just one. Our text will be one verse in chapter 1, but just to kind of set the stage Aside from what's going on in the church, contextually, uh, four different places in, in chapter 1, Paul refers to his bonds. Uh, my bonds, my bonds, my bonds, my bonds in Christ in verse 13, and in verse 7, 14, and 16, he refers to his bonds. And you say, what are these bonds? Well, he was in prison. And so he made it very clear, or the Holy Spirit did, moving him to write this epistle, that this was indeed one of the prison epistles along with Ephesians and Colossians and Philemon. So a prison epistle, think of it kind of twofold, writing from prison in Rome, but remembering prison as he's writing to a church that was started in part because he spent time in prison there. And so let me, as you can, you can camp out in, in Philippians chapter 1, I'll give you some of the a historical backdrop from the book of Acts of this church being established and what Paul went through to see the church established. It's uh, recorded for us in Acts chapter 16. Uh, this uh, starts with the Macedonian call. And I'll pick up in verse 10. And after he had seen the vision, he being Paul, uh, immediately we, so that would include uh, Dr. Luke and, and the other members of the team, we endeavored to go to Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days. And then jumping down to, to verse 22, because I 
you know, up to that point, it's all, hey, wonderful. They got the vision. They went, psh, beelined over there, da-da. And then they start getting beaten and whipped and, and have their clothes ripped and thrown in, in prison. Uh, and the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto to God, and the prisoners heard them. And it reminds me of a song. I keep waiting for someone in the church to sing. Uh, God wants to hear us sing or hear you sing or something like that. Some of you are familiar with that. Uh, so, uh, And then it goes on from there, and what must I do to be saved? And that's a different story. But the backdrop, again, of Paul writing a prison epistle from prison is writing to the church in Philippi, a church that was started because he was in prison there. And the epistle, as you know, is not weeping sadness and, and uh, sorrows. It's key words of joy and rejoicing. And so it's praising in prison, joy in trials again and again and again. How can that be? Well, the things which happened to Paul in the prison in Philippi fell out unto the furtherance of the gospel. Specifically, the ones he's writing to, it fell out to the furtherance of the gospel in them because they were there as a church for him to be able to write to. And so it's like he's, he's jogging their memory. Yeah, I'm writing from prison here. And in the letter, as we're going to see in our text, he's saying, the things that have happened unto me now, being in prison, have fallen out to the furtherance of the gospel. Oh, by the way, you saw that in your very own town, your very own jail, when you saw our clothes get ripped off and us beaten and thrown in the jail. And, and yet, you know, right in your congregation there, Mr. Former Jailer is one of your members. Uh, so it fell out to the furtherance of the gospel then. So now I want you to understand that the same thing is falling out to the furtherance of gospel uh, now. And so um, this is emphasized in the opening of the letter and he's, as he's writing to them. I thank, uh, verse 3 of Philippians 1, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all uh, making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. And I just that's, uh, that's somewhat coincidental with the, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord refers to, at that instant, uh, we're raptured out of here, what God is doing here on the earth, dealing with Israel and his wrath being... Um, stirred up upon them for their rejection of him, bringing them to salvation to call upon him. But the day, of, uh, the day of Christ would refer to the same time period, but what's going on in heaven with us and Christ after we've been pulled out of here. So prophetically, day of the Lord and day of Christ are happening at the same time, but day of the Lord is referring to down here on the earth and day of Christ up there. Anyway, just thought I'd throw that in there. Verse 7, even as it is meet for me, or fit and suitable for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. So he's writing to them in the opening of this letter saying, hey, it's just great that I can write to you as a church. And you're there because of some bad things that happened to me while I was there, but it fell out for good. And so uh, he's writing to them in this epistle, uh, that this principle of things falling out into the furtherance of the gospel, even though they would seem to be pretty bad in our lives at times, uh, that principle still applies in his life as he's being used in, in prison in Rome to reach those in Caesar's house and, and just get the gospel out in a different place. And he's telling them, that as they understand it in his life, everything he's going through is falling out to the furtherance of the gospel. They need to see that that applies to their life as well as, as uh, individual families and members of that church, but their life as a church as a whole. And so all of that points to verse 12, which is I've kind of been saying over and over again, but verse 12 of chapter 1 is really the core of the, the text. Uh, 
for our thought tonight. Uh, but I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. And so if you want a title, it's Falling Unto Furtherance. Falling Unto Furtherance. And my thesis statement is this. Things which happen to us can fall out under the furtherance of the gospel. Why listen? Because things happen to us. Uh, and maybe that's even heightened uh, with regards to this contrast between seasonal merriment, the Christmas season, and what some have been going through in that, that same joyous, happy time, and it's not so happy and joyous to them. Uh, outline, just so I know where I'm going, not necessarily so you understand it, is threefold, uh, a series of comparison and, and contrasts. First, and it's all focused just on, on that, that main thought, things falling out unto the furtherance of the gospel. Uh, we'll look at it being both personal and corporate. So Paul, on the personal level, and then corporate, he's trying to teach this lesson to this church that he's writing to. Uh, then uh, next we'll look at falling and furthering. That's pretty much the title, falling unto furtherance. So falling but furthering at the same time. And then the third comparison and, and or contrast is having this understanding being both reflective and perspective. And what I mean there is, I don't know if it's easy, but the further away we get from negative circumstances in our life, it seems we have, hopefully we're maturing spiritually along the way as well, so we have that going for us. But we can look back and, and, and God points some things out and we can see things that have shaken out to the furtherance of the gospel when at the time we just, that was just miserable. And, you know, just, uh, maybe a simple example would be I was in the hospital and it was awful. I was in pain and I didn't expect it and it was at a bad time as if there's ever a good time to be in the hospital. Uh, but, you know... Remember that one nurse that came in and someone from church had just visited and they left a track and so I was here, I gave it to the nurse. And maybe sometime after that, that nurse shows up at the church. Uh, just an example, it's a typical one that comes, comes to mind. So I would say if we just broke out the coffee and had donuts and sat around for a while tonight, we could come up with some good reflections, some good stories from most of us, if not everyone, of something bad that happened in your life in the past that you can now look back on and say, there was good in that, you know, Romans 8, 28, but specifically, uh, not just necessarily from that into Romans 8, 29, the conforming of us to Christ in the sufferings that we go through, but the, uh, here in, in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 12, the furthering out of, furtherance of the gospel. Reflective, 2020 hindsight, but perspective such that we can take those lessons in that principle and apply it in negative circumstances in the here and now, projecting forward and seeing, saying, okay, I don't know why you're allowing this in my life, Lord, but because I've seen what you've done in the past, things falling out into the furtherance of the gospel, I can see going forward, not the details, the 2020 hindsight, but at least 2020 in understanding the principle uh, with those spiritual glasses, the, that biblical worldview going forward, that it can fall out forward under the furtherance of the gospel. So you say, well, that's just your outline. You just preached your entire message. Well, maybe so. Uh, we learn by repetition. So I'll go through the points anyway. Um, so let's, uh, let's ponder this scriptural thought to bring 2020 hindsight into foresight. So personal and corporate both. Um, Paul's prayer really is that what he understood at a personal level, they would understand at a corporate level as, as a church. Um, but I personally uh, uh, would, ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. So the Philippian imprisonment, his current Roman imprisonments, imprisonment or uh, it seems he was imprisoned a couple times in Rome. And is that the only thing that 
fell out in things that fell out in Paul's life, a couple imprisonments. No, uh, there's a list we go to typically in the scriptures. It's in Second Corinthians, and I thought, I wonder when that was written. Well, Second Corinthians was written five years before this letter. <laughs> So five years before, he had already gone through all these other things, uh, and he's sitting there writing, yeah, these things that happened to me, they've fallen out to the furtherance of the gospel. So he certainly has learned this lesson, and he's, he's imploring them to learn the same lesson. So on a personal level, I'll read from that passage. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 28. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, get this line, in prisons more frequent. So we tend to think of, well, there was the Philippian jailer, so he was jail in jail in Philippi, and the prison epistles were written from the jail in, or one of the, the, the cells in Rome, and maybe he was imprisoned there twice, so he was in prison three times. And he makes it sound like, you know, everywhere I went, they threw me in prison <laughs> because they didn't like me preaching Christ. In prisons more frequent. And then the next thought, in deaths oft. And we think, well, he was dragged out of the one town and, uh, and they stoned him and they left him for dead. And just as they were getting ready to rejoice and go back in, in town, God revives him and he dusts himself off and he goes right back into that town and, and preaches to him. So we think, yeah, we remember when he, when he uh, had this near death or a literal death experience and was resurrected. But he says, in deaths oft. And then he gives, goes on this list that's somewhat familiar to us. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save once. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false Brethren, that's a whole lot of perils. In weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. You take all that, which was a whole five years prior, and there might have been a few things that happened in that five year interim that he could have added to the list. And he says to the church in Philippi, I would, you should understand, brethren. That the things, maybe we could take all of that and say the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel. What a statement. And certainly we're understanding the Holy Spirit is showing us that Paul got that. He understood it. He certainly believed it. But his prayer was that they, the church in Philippi, would be able to understand it. And so it takes it from Paul learning it at the personal level and his prayers that they would get it at the, at the corporate level. Uh, but I would ye, plural, should understand brethren, that they would understand uh, it in Paul's life to their furtherance or profit, that they may understand it in their life as a church and serve with the right attitude when things happen. And so he's saying, I want you to learn it in my life, but then make the application in your life as a church. And, and he says this uh, there in chapter 1, in verse uh, 27 to 30, for example. So, so put this thought that I'm going to read, uh, as, you can, as you follow along, in what he's trying to tell them in verse 12. Uh, so only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which ye saw in me, and now here to be uh, in me. I got that right. So as he's, he's writing, he, 
I find this to be somewhat of an elaboration of, of verse 12 where he says, I have this prayer for you that you'd understand what's happened to me. It's fallen out to the furtherance of the gospel. And now as you live out your life, your conversation, and things happen to you, and you partake of the sufferings of Christ, see that those two, just like you saw in my life, and I've told you, can fall out in your life as a church under the furtherance of the gospel. And that should affect your attitude, uh, the way you view things that are happening in, in your life. In chapter 2, uh, he continues, I, I believe, this, this same thought, verses 14 to 16. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. Well, there's the furtherance of the gospel right there. That I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. So he's continuing to say these lessons that we learn in other people's lives, as Paul was saying, or in our lives personally, and in the life of our church looking backwards, should affect the attitude which we go through things, sufferings now that the Lord's allowing, and see taking those lessons from behind, pushing them forward, that these things can fall out into the furtherance of the gospel. So as individuals, and then collectively uh, as a church, as we would go through things that are unexpected and would seem to be suffering as a body, as a whole, we can say, well, wait a minute, this is, we'll, we'll not murmur, we'll not dispute, we'll uh, we'll be blameless and harmless, uh, holding forth the word of life that these things can fall out to the furtherance of the gospel. And we won't necessarily know, of course, looking forward how that's going to happen or, or the particulars, but we have the confidence looking forward from looking backwards, seeing the things that have already happened. Uh, so that's a personal and, and corporate look at this, this uh, thought. Uh, so we'll look at uh, falling and furthering, because at the time it seems very much like falling, these negative circumstances in our life. Oh, look, I fell down again. But uh, both Paul, uh, well, Paul and Timothy and Epaphrodites, he gives his own example, then he gives Timothy as an example, then he gives Epaphrodites as an example of things that have happened in their lives, really unto death or near death, and yet they were all working to fall out to the furtherance of the gospel. He, he said, Paul, in, in chapter 2, verse 17, yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice in service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. So he's saying, that's the whole letter. It's just joy and rejoicing, even though he's in prison. He was in prison there. And he says, even if I give my very life, if it falls out to the furtherance of the gospel there in Philippi, well, praise God for that. So Paul had that attitude of falling and furthering at the same time. He gives testimony that his son in the faith, Timothy, uh, was like-minded with him, really, as no other person that he mentored was. Uh, verse 19 of chapter 2 there, reading to 22. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus, Time uh, being a value, and Theus, God, so a value to God. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. He's saying, no one like this guy that I, that I mentored who will naturally care for your state as opposed to his own. And then he says, in contrast, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. He's saying all but, but Timothy. No one's like Timothy. But ye know the proof of him that as a son with the father, he hath served with me in the gospel. So as Paul's making this case in, in back in chapter 1, verse 12, our text, and he's reiterating the things that have happened unto him have fallen out under the furtherance of the gospel. He's saying that this one son in the faith that he's mentored has that same attitude, and he's learned that like, like no one else that Paul knows. And he's saying, wow, look at that as, as another example of falling and furthering at the, the same time. And Epaphrodites uh, they have this dialogue in chapter 2, uh, not dialogue, uh, monologue, he's writing it to them. So uh, verse 25 through 30 of how Epaphrodites as well was serving them, serving others to the furtherance of the gospel, even to the point of his own death. And there was a concern that, that he was sick. Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you, Epaphrodites, uh, 
my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick, nigh unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the more carefully that when ye see him again, ye may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation, because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. So he starts with his own testimony of falling and furthering, and then he gives Timothy as an example of falling and and anything that would happen in his life, he's just... uh, naturally caring for the furtherance of the gospel and the work of the faith in others. And then the same with Epaphrodites, being nigh unto death, but saying, you know, I don't even regard my own life. It's not about me. It's about uh, uh, furthering the gospel. And then uh, Epaphrodites gets a shout out in chapter 4 and verse 18 as well. Uh, Paul saying, I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphrodites, the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. So all three willing to give their lives for the furtherance of the gospel, of, of falling, these things which have fallen out in their lives, close to death and eventually death, of course, uh, but furthering as well. And then let's finish uh, just seeing if God might show us personally and as a, as a church here assembled tonight, how we can be reflective in looking at this lesson, but then take that reflection and project it it forward. Take the 2020 uh, hindsight first, but I would, ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened, past tense, unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. So these things that happened have already fallen out unto the furtherance of the gospel. So he's saying, I want you to see that from my past so that then we can take that biblical principle and project that attitude of joy and rejoicing in the presence and forward, uh, even though it seems like we're going through some bad times. In chapter 3, it it says in verse 7 and 8, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss, For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And uh, this thought appears kind of in a tangential way in some of his other epistles to the church in uh, Galatia, for example. The encouragement taking this lesson going forward is that we would not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. What's that reaping? That's the furtherance of the gospel. So not being wearying, but seeing that the things which happen to us can fall out to the furtherance of the gospel. And as he wrote in the resurrection chapter of the church of uh, God in Corinth, uh, the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, therefore my beloved brethren, therefore what? Therefore the resurrection. Therefore my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding, in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It's, even if that laboring is, is suffering at the same time and being conformed to the image of Christ, partaking in his suffering, it still can fall out to the furtherance of the gospel. So things which happen to us as individuals, families, as a, as a church body, things which happen to us can fall out unto the furtherance of the gospel. And this biblical this spiritual worldview can help us see more clearly yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And I was thinking of some examples in my life. Uh, things that happened in my Navy career. Uh, and my wife is sitting there saying, hmm. And uh, many of you had a Navy career, and it wasn't all... Uh, rose petals and, and puppy dog tails, which I really do enjoy. Happy puppy dog tail. Uh, but there are some things that were pretty gnarly in my Navy career that at the time I just did not enjoy and I felt like, well, why am I going through this? And yet I can look back, 2020 hindsight, and see that uh, 
those things have put me in this pulpit today. Um, if God would not have allowed some, some of the experiences I went through in the Navy to happen, I would likely still be in the Navy and be miserable and not preaching the gospel. And so I would, ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel as I stand here tonight and, and say, Thus saith the Lord. At the time, I didn't understand that, and my prayer for me in studying this out is to be able to take that 2020 hindsight and project it uh, forward into things that happen today. There are things that have happened since I've been in the ministry uh, about 10, 10 years now, post Navy, that I didn't necessarily understand at the time. Uh, that I can, a few years later, distant, look back and say, Ah, oh, God, you're so smart and I'm so stupid. <laughs> Can't you just give me a little of that insight as it's happening instead of years later? Uh, but I can look back and see things uh, that have fallen out under the furtherance of the gospel. Um, such that the challenge to me from the lesson tonight is as I see things in the ministry now or in this coming year as we we head into 2018 that I don't understand that might not be comfortable um, that I can take the lessons from the past and say well, wait a minute there's a huge potential here for this to fall out into the furtherance of the gospel so instead of whining and complaining why don't I joy and rejoice and, and, and the prisoners will hear that are around me as with Paul and Silas oh, what about you what about you and what about us as a church? I, uh, I was thinking about it, uh, but we came, I retired 10 years ago. We came back to, to Whidbey 12 years ago, still had a couple years left in the Navy when we came back from Spain. So um, we've got a 12-year chunk of, of period to look at the history of the church here. Tack on three and a half years, uh, almost four, our first time here, a couple years in between uh, shore duty in Fallon and, and going to Spain. Uh, we parked here for a couple of years before going over the pond. And so what's that, 12 and 4, 16, 17, 18, uh, 18 years or so. To simply say, I can look back on 18 years of the history of this church, a little disjointed, and see some things that I didn't necessarily understand at the time that weren't necessarily comfortable at the time and didn't understand and yet now I just, I give testimony to people of, wow, this was not understood, but it fell out to the furtherance of the gospel. And, and, and you can think in your own mind what your chunk of history of the church is. And since you've been here and maybe some things you thought at the time, I didn't get that. But now as you see God just working and moving, you, you think, oh, what are we doing in uh, you know, Jamaica, Wenatchee, and all these places, the South Pacific, and uh, the Philippines, Mindanao, Cebu, a lot of things involved in all that. I didn't understand at the time, but I can look back now and say, go God to the furtherance of, of the gospel. And so again, the challenge to me, I believe the challenge to us as a church is to be able to see these things in our lives, to see these things in the life of this church that we didn't understand at the time and now see that they've fallen out to the furtherance of the gospel and say, okay, we're going to experience some things in 2018. Uh, it's not going to be all cotton candy and whatever your favorite hobby or confectionery delight is. There'll be some tough times. There'll be some sufferings, some conforming to the image of Christ and partaking of his sufferings. And as a church together, we'll, we'll uh, perhaps um, buck each other up and encourage and love and provoke, uh, provoke into love and to good works as we assemble week after week. Uh, but prayerfully, we don't have to wait years down the road if the Lord should not pull us out of here tonight. Um, to look back and say, oh yeah, that fell out to the furtherance of the gospel. How about as they're happening, we kind of link up arms and say, this, this could be falling out to the furtherance of the gospel. Hey, let's sing. <laughs> you know, let's, let's praise God. Let's see if some prisoners around us will hear and, uh, and maybe say, what must I do to be saved? And there's the furtherance of the gospel right there. So uh, this message, uh, again, when I studied it out at the end of last week, I didn't fully understand it. As I've been looking at it the last few days and even this afternoon, it just made more and more sense to me.
in my life, and I pray in yours and in the life of Bible Baptist Church, Oak Harbor. The preceding message was preached from the pulpit of Bible Baptist Church, Oak Harbor, Washington. You can find additional information about the church and our publications ministry on the web at bbcoakharbor.org. For further assistance with specific questions, please feel free to give us a call at area code 360-675-8311. Thank you for listening. Our prayer is that you received a blessing from the preaching of God's Word.